So what I wanted to be able to do is, is kind of get your head in the game about how the diverse settings of our workplace contribute to the multiple perspectives that are around the table with the people you work with. Um, whether it's managers, people you know, who supervise you, directors, C-level um, professionals, or it's people that you supervise. Like, there are lots of different perspectives around a table and even within an, one person's own worldview. And so while most of our session is going to be talking about and thinking about and strategizing about negotiation and dealing with conflict, I want to actually just kind of surface ahead of time because to preempt and to be proactive beforehand and, and thinking about what even might contribute to this can actually provide a little bit of, of peace and, and completeness for people, shleimut, right? Shalom, which means peace, and um, shleimut, which is complete, are the same word, actually, in Hebrew. So here's what I want you to do. In your packet, if you flip the page, you're going to see one sheet that has all of these interesting images on it. So just to kind of remind you of perspective, take a look at those images. Don't overthink it. Write down, if you can, the first thing you see in any one of those images. Take like, I don't know, two minutes at most. Share a little bit with some of your neighbors what you all saw to see some of the, the, the uh, diversity to what your vision was. So share with everyone at your table. And if you got exactly the same thing, I'm happy to kind of help point out some other lens and perspective. Take about a minute. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Here is my question for you. On the back of this page, on the back of this page, you'll see the first big question. What is it that influences people's perspective? Any number of things. Just jot down a few quick ideas, then we'll share back to the front. What are some of the things that affect people's perspective, whether it's emotionally how they feel about something, visually, right, we just saw that just now, organizationally, creatively, conceptually, even cognitively. What shapes people's perspective? Okay, let's start sharing some answers. Let's go. Experiences. Experiences. Which someone, we talked about that a little bit earlier during the tech study about if someone's had a bad experience with a certain type of a topic or if they're having something going on in their life. Yep, Shana. Their current, not previous experiences, but like what's brought in <coughs> Okay, so their current, their current state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Implicit biases. Okay, tease that out more. What kind of implicit biases might? Biases that we don't even know that we have or that we don't even know the person that we're talking to has based on life experiences. Okay, what else? Socioeconomic. Gender, Thank you. Gender. Age, bias. Yep. What else? Um, All right. Pick up on it. What religion, other? Religion. Political. Politics. Politics. Right. What else might affect people's implicit biases? Yep. I think how they think. Like if they're more like financially, if they're more fiscally responsible, if they're more like where they so if someone's default setting? Okay, so left brain, right brain. <laughs> Which also speaks to learning styles as someone who's had a career in education, right? Different learning styles that people have affect how they understand or see things. Okay. Keep talking. Let's get a few more on the table. Culture. culture. Tell me more about culture. Um, so someone's like cultural background um, kind of goes into implicit biases with religion, um, family history. Family history, that's a great one. How many of you have worked with people who are, are um, who have lived in other countries or are from other countries originally. Could be a number of you in this room have worked with people from, you know, from South America, from Latin America, from Israel, from Europe, from FSU. I mean, have you worked with diverse populations before, right? Even just where someone's from, right? National origin. Have you had the experience that they have certain cultural differences that somehow shape and frame how they see certain, certain topics? Okay, great. Other possibilities? Frame of reference. Tell me more about frame of reference. Well, someone can only understand what they've experienced 
in their life, if they haven't, if it, if it isn't something they've ever heard of or experienced or knows that exists, then they can't even think outside of those. Okay, so of okay, so if it's completely new to right, new to me, either that's exciting and dynamic, or it's like I, I that doesn't even compute. Right. Okay, great. Yes. Yep. Um, this is gonna be hard to explain. Okay. But, um, innate fears or innate feelings, like um, even though I have Holocaust survivors in my family, I didn't know this until I went through a seminar, and that there's a lot a fear of dogs and a fear of uniforms are innately um, felt in families of Holocaust survivors because. They yep. were afraid of dogs and uh -huh. uniforms way back. So the legacy of being in a family is beyond just certain things you stand for, but it could be, I mean, there's actually research about the higher levels of anxiety within the Jewish community who had been affected by the Holocaust, even though my, I, I was not in the Holocaust, but that my grandparents were and how that transferred right. to my mother it's, and my father. Yes. Right, that's where I was, I was actually going to say mental health. Right, right. Um, Thank you. Education level, excellent. Physical space. What about own comfort level? Um, like Whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, maybe, right? So your yeah. temperament and personality, right? There's a lot about life experience, and there's also some of how you're kind of set in terms of your own personal wiring. Default yeah, default settings. Big long list here we talked about, right? Socioeconomic level, gender, age, religion, politics. We shouldn't forget sexual orientation, right? There are a number of different perspectives, again, that influence how a person sees things. So as you're anticipating, how do I, how do I work well? How do, how do I create not uniformity in, in my work setting, but a, a sense of unity? It's important to think about well, how do, I, how do I preempt that? So what I really want to kind of focus in particular on is the age piece. Because I think in our society, Cindy and I have been talking about this, I think we're all pretty aware right, of, of all the different complexity related to family and, and, and gender and the political issues and religion. Like we, I think those are very much in the forefront. And my experience has been, and, and you can nod yes or you know, shake your head no if you don't agree, I feel like when we talk about age, which really relates to generations, what we find is there's typically a negative default setting for all of us. Oh, those millennials, da, 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 right? Oh, you know, pe you know, people who are you know, about to retire, like they're just so stuffy. They're just so traditional about things. Right? I feel like when we look at, at the generations, oftentimes our immediate understanding is that it's, it's, a, it's a negative piece, right? That a generation doesn't bring anything strong to the table, that if anything, it just gets in the way. And so what we wanted to do was talk a little bit more about what does it mean to embrace what generations offer. So I want you to think about, well, actually, you might want to look at the resources first. Let's do that. There is a page in here. I made like a quick cheat sheet. Where is that? It is on the page before. This is a quick cheat sheet, and I actually found another great resource, which I couldn't get to Cindy in time for copying. It is the page before all the cool pictures of just looking at research, some of the typical understandings that researchers have, have gleaned from each generation. I want you to kind of like just scan it quickly and maybe jot down some notes, whether it's your personal experience for who you are in your generation, because everyone's reflected here, or people you've worked with. And instead of thinking about it from the negative, oh, they just don't have the same work ethic I do. What is it that they do bring to the table? So look at that and see if you can highlight or underline any words that resonate with you. Like, you know, that's true about, about that, that generation. What generation? This whole thing? Any, well, yeah, just scan for words that stand out to you. The first column, you may want to go back just to, if you turn this way, it might be easier to start with. It might kind of work you up. The first page of it actually has the columns, right? The first column is what's the traditional, the greatest generation. Okay. Not as many people in the workforce left in that generation, still some, right? Boomers, plenty of baby boomers still in the workforce. Gen X. Now they're and talking about the next generation. 
called Gen Z. Gen Z, that's right. Uh, I, I think my children fall into that category. They are just on that cusp of, of millennial. And as you see, when I put this chart together, I did not give the specific years because depending on the researcher, they define often where the generation begins and ends a little differently. And a lot of that also stems from your life experience, where you were when these things were, you know, when, when the experience of a generation was happening. Do you accept that there are exennials? That? Define that. Exennials are those, I'm going to put years on it. Yep. Born basically between 78 and, nine, and nine. 85. That know that might have had cell phones before they went to college. Most got them in college, and for the most part, can tell you exactly where they were on 9/11. Whereas those a little bit younger, like the 86, 87, they kind of know where they were, but it was not as clear in their mind. And they did, they had cell phones at a much younger age than the 78 to 85 years. Right. And there's also, also the me generation between. The, the boomers and Gen Xers. Mm -hmm. Right. Know, those were the yuppies and the... So right. what's really important in what you're surfacing is instead of any of us labeling someone by the general generation, we should be thinking about what are the life experiences that shaped their perspective. 9-11, right? My oldest daughter is home from college for a hot second last night. <laughs> and she said to me about how she's really glad that she's growing up right now in this current political climate because it's such an, an extraordinary part of what she knows will become history and a lot of conversation about the discourse and the lack of civility. And she said, because when 9-11 happened, I was so young, I didn't remember it. And I have other friends who were older than me that do. And so they have a different understanding. So I, what else shapes someone's generational experience, right? Which can help us understand some of those nuanced cuts in between. What, what is it that affects? JFK. Correct, JFK, right? That November 22nd date affected baby boomers in a very different way than someone who was just entering Gen X, right? Just being born. What other kinds of things influence a generation? Vietnam War. War, okay, politics, war. Woodstock. Woodstock, right? So cultural, right, cultural revolutions. Economics, exactly. If you were a kid of the 70s, you had a different kind of life experience with the worry your family was thinking about. The death of Princess Diana also was another big one. Right. Probably mostly for an American girl, teenage girl. But for the, le but the leadership who was around, exactly. Focus on education, right? How much educational opportunities are available? What else affects what about, the children? Um, trends, like when I was in college, the big thing was breaking, women breaking through the glass ceiling. Yeah. Right, so the Me Too movement has come out now as, as obviously a, a very large stand which shapes another generation. Not that it doesn't have influence on others, but if it's part of kind of your life perspective. Shauna? I mean, how people have, in each generation, how people have managed to move up socioeconomically. Okay. How easier hard that was. Right. How open or close that was. Right. So opportunity, I guess maybe is how we'll say, and some of the other societal and economic influences that, that shape opportunity. Family structure, right? I was among the generation of kids who came home with the key hidden under the mat because both parents were working and the other structures of, of childcare and families helping one another didn't quite exist yet. They hadn't shaped. So the latchkey kid, that's what that was, right? So that was my experience. I have to be in charge of my brother to do his homework. That shapes your experience. Anything else you can think of? Because I think it's important so we don't label by gener generation and we look at even those small niches within generations to say, wow, they have a lot of experience that shapes who they are. Anything else? Yeah. Well, I think even like I kind of think of myself kind of being on the cusp. So like when the recession happened in 2008, my sister and her friends who were only two years older, a different financial outlook than those who finished college after like or when the recession was happening. Right. Exactly. We're in the same category. We're all millennials or millennials. But a millennials. major event happened. Right. 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 And it divided. It's like a. Like, even me and my sister, it's like two separate futures. Right, exactly. And it, it changes the face of it. So, yeah. There was, um, what interesting, I'm looking at schools for my 11-year-old, and all the admissions counselors are saying that in 2007, 2008, because the recession birth rates went down. Yeah. Just really small yeah. yeah. Right. Which that... Right, which again also affects how a generational experience or people, you know, as they're kind of moving through the funnel of life, how that shapes their experience. So Gen Xers are actually a smaller population demographically. So 
there is this assumption, oh, they're like the middle child, they feel like they're forgotten. And that, right now, again, that doesn't mean that's how every person who is a Gen Xer acts, but the, the size of a generation and the influence that they bring based on size, right? Um, millennials are a sizable population. So when you look at how tech forward everything is becoming and the shift and change in workplace culture with, with, with millennials now shaping the leadership, that's from their experience where technology was just woven in, right? They, as you see, right, it's not that they have adapted, it's just kind of the integrated into their life experience, right? They care, they have a different experience with work-life balance, right, of wanting a balance, right. So here, yes, go ahead. Say, go ahead, Devar. Civil rights, minority rights, yes. gay rights, anti-Semitism. Right. They're all negative things or, or positive things that have changed significantly yep. in different decades, different times that lead to a totally different experience. Right. So the, so the lens someone brings has so much that shapes it. So what I want to spend the last two to three minutes talking about is so that last question on that organizer, the flip side of all the images. What is it? Do, that you imagine that you can do to anticipate what, what might be shaping and influencing diverse perspectives. So, well, yes, we're about to spend the rest of our session talking about negotiation and conflict management, but how do we even try to keep things harmonious, understanding that there is such diversity? Just kind of have to figure out, like, know who you're supposed to be talking to and do a little, like, background research. And look, just a little bit, like, kind of know where, like, about what age they are, what they're, like, if you're working with them, like where, what they've come from, yeah, knowing your audience. And know your audience, which goes back to last session we talked about that, right? If you're going to tell your message, you got to know your audience. Try to have an understanding of their life experience. Again, it does not mean, it's my favorite phrase, there are no cookie cutter people here. Right? A lot of times the reason, and the way I like to talk about generations with those blurred defined lines is because birth order may affect if you're on the end of one, the beginning of the other, but you're the oldest, versus if you're the youngest, that affects kind of what your generational shaping may be. So no cookie cutter people here. What else possibly could you be doing to anticipate the diverse needs? Yeah. This is a little more in depth of know your audience, but it's also like not just knowing them in the, work, in the workplace, but actually knowing them. Knowing their family life, knowing if they have siblings, knowing if they have kids, knowing what they like to do. So knowing them as people, yeah. all right, and having an understanding. If you have five children under the age of eight, you can appreciate that someone's life experience may be that they are exhausted <laughs> all the time, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> what else? Yep. Yeah, Change your own perspective. Excellent. Tell so, me what you mean by that. Well, as a millennial, I can't tell you how many meetings I'm in. And they're like, let's talk about the millennials, and it's so negative. Yep. When I looked at your list, I had my own perceptions about different generations as well, just like you said. So really, you know, we need to know your audience, but mm -hmm. then look at the strengths of that audience as opposed to the negatives, and come from that perspective, I think, would really change the message. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Everyone comes with baggage in, any, in, in some way, shape, or form, but everyone comes with strength. So to try to see it, right, change your lens. What is the strength they're bringing to the table, and how do we harness that? Nicole, did you have something to say? No? Oh, you're stretching. Good. It's good to get some energy. Um, how, could you, how open do you feel you should be in communicating with people about this? Yeah. What would that look like? I mean, it depends on your work situation, but... Your direct supervisor might know more about your home life, your personal life, everything than the CEO of the company. Like the CEO of the company should know a little bit about you, but doesn't need to know every detail. Right, and I don't. And look, that we have to be sensitive to how much. You have to, you know, you can or should ask about other people. Obviously, in hiring, we know that there's rules about that. But in terms of being relatable and making sure that people feel like they are personally acknowledged, but at the same time, not feeling like the only thing I can do is just try to get a whole like profile down of you and, and to kind of pin you ahead of time. What about offering the opportunity to ask questions, right? If you're rolling out a new project, right? Give people that opportunity to ask questions, recognizing that the questions aren't necessarily meant as a challenge, going back to the text study, but it's about raising the level of discourse, trying to have an understanding of what it, what it means, what it's about. For you, if you're communicating upward, making clear statements about your understanding of a new policy or your understanding of a, of a new 
uh, campaign, whatever the issue is. But to be able to be clear, in my experience, I feel that this new campaign brings some challenges. I'd like to talk about that, right? You're not saying I won't do it. What you're saying is, is that I have experiences that are shaping my understanding and I want to bring those to the table. I'd love your help, supervisor, in understanding some of this and teasing this out. That's not confrontational. That's acknowledging that I bring a diverse perspective and I'd like to put that onto the table. Other thoughts of what you can do? Yeah. Oh, excellent. It was my last thing I wanted to make sure. Tell me what that is, just so everyone knows. Just being present in the conversations for not coming in and anticipating what could be said, but being open to like listening and hearing what people have to say. Right, exactly. And, and certainly also in that is to then repeat back what you're hearing people say. So they feel validated in, that you heard them. And if you got it wrong, because we all have our own perspectives, they can correct that and rectify your understanding of their perspective. Yeah. Something to go along with that, and Jay, people have heard me say this because I went to a conference last week and I'm shooting a piece of this nugget from the rooftop. Um, but when you're listening to someone, listen to them as if they're the smartest person in the world and like they're, what they're saying is like gold because you, when you're doing that, you're really taking in what they're saying. And I feel like a lot of us, I mean, I this is true at the JCC, I'm sure it's true in other organizations as well. You know your people you work with so well that you think, you know what they're gonna say to you before you even start talking to them, you think you do. So when you're listening to someone as if they're a genius, like you really value what they say and that kind of shapes how you listen and how you interpret what they're saying. Right, so it's, it's no different saying. than what we were just talking about in your corner about the, the bars, that image with the bars. Mm -hmm. Seeing the words there, three, no, four, or not four, right? Shaped how you saw, yeah. right? So being able to go in with a certain understanding. Mm -hmm. I want to honor what this person brings to the table and even sharing with your colleagues. That's my approach is I, I, you know, no matter how contrarian someone may seem, I know they bring perspective and experience that we should be thinking about. Okay, important that we're thinking through who our people are that we work with, up, down, side, and around. I'm gonna pass the baton now to Cindy because we wanna spend the bulk of our time with Dina talking about how to resolve some of those issues when they do pop up.